So good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Young, and I am a program officer with the Board of on Chemical Sciences and Technology here at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, I want to extend a warm welcome to you all in person and to those online. Uh, today, we gather to discuss a subject of increasing importance, uh, especially in our daily lives, indoor chemistry. It is a topic that impacts our health, comfort, and well-being. This workshop will have a special focus on recommendations from the National Academy's uh, consensus report, Why Indoor Chemistry Matters. The four sessions we have planned today will drive conversations around research progress made in this area and feature opportunities presented in this growing field. For those participating online, I encourage you to take part in the Q&A sessions. At various points throughout the workshop, the moderator will open the floor for questions. At that time, please type your questions in the chat box, or you can raise your hand and we will um, spotlight you. Uh, our moderators will do their best to ensure they are answered. For those participating in person, if you have a question, please walk to the microphone on either side of the room. Uh, if you can't access the aisles, please raise your hand and we will bring the mic to you. All right, next, I would like to express our gratitude to the Alfred Sloan Foundation. Their generous support has made this workshop possible. I also want to take a, a moment to give a special thanks to our workshop planners, um, Drs. Glenn Morrison, Dustin Poppendick, and Charlie Weschler. The tireless efforts spent by our planning team these last few months have been instrumental in shaping today's event and ensuring its success. All right, so I'm going to go and introduce our planners. So Dr. Morrison is a professor of environmental sciences and engineering at UNC Chapel Hill. His research is related to the chemistry and physics of indoor air pollution and its influence on human exposure and contaminants, uh, exposure to contaminants. Recently, his group has focused on how clothing influences indoor chemistry and occupant exposure to these chemicals. Dr. Morrison is a fellow of the International Society, Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, where he has also served as its president from 2014 to 2016. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley. Dr. Dustin Poppendick is an environmental engineer at NIST. He is interested in studying building materials and designs and how they affect indoor chemistry. He has investigated emissions from kerosene can lamps, spray polyurethane foam, and non-smoldering cigarette butts. He received his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from UT Austin. Dr. Charlie Weschler, a longtime researcher in indoor air quality, he spent decades at Bell Labs before transitioning to academic roles at US and international institutions. Currently, he serves as a visiting professor at Tsinghua University and holds adjunct positions at Rutgers School of Public Health. Notably, he has served on several National Academy of Sciences committee and for nearly a decade, he was on the US EPA Science Advisory Board. Dr. Weschler has received prestigious awards for his contribution, including the 2017 Hagen Smith Prize from Atmospheric Environment. And in 2020, he was elected as fellow of AAAS. With over 26,000 citations, his research along with his devotion to chemistry policy is undeniable. Finally, I want to thank the National Academy staff, Ms. Brenna Albine, Darlene Bro, Kay Wims, and Eric Edkins. Your invaluable support in handling the administrative and logistical operations for this workshop made all the difference. Thank you for your immense contribution. At this moment, I invite Dr. Morrison, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Vicki Grassian, my friend, who is a distinguished professor, distinguished chair in physical chemistry, co-director for the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment, and associate dean for research in the School of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Grassian's research encompasses the chemistry of environmental interfaces, atmospheric aerosols, and aqueous microdroplets engineered geochemical nanomaterials, and importantly for this meeting, indoor surfaces. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, several of us reached out to Vicki 
um, imploring her to join us in this journey of indoor uh, science and indoor chemistry. And she joined us at several uh, meetings and workshops and that, and I'm glad that she has stayed the course with us on this journey. Um, Vicki has received too many awards to list here, um, but they do include the ACS Geochemistry Division Medal and Symposium, American Institute of Chemist Chemical Pioneer Award, American Chemical Society National Award in Service Chemistry, and most recently the 2024 Pittsburgh Spectroscopy Award. She's a fellow of the American Chemical Society, AAAS, the Royal, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. I've enjoyed working with Vicki over the years on publications, presentations, workshops, and the recent National Academy of Sciences report. Vicki. Hey, thank you, Glenn, uh, for that uh, very nice introduction. I appreciate it. And yes, it's, it is your fault that I'm here today uh, and pulling me in in the early 2000s into a fascinating field. So how is this showing? Um, it, 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 yeah, is that, that's better. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, my name is Vicki Gracian, as Glenn uh, mentioned, and I currently am in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. And today I want to talk to you about a recent National Academy's report on why indoor chemistry matters. And this is the second workshop that they've had on this topic. And really we want to talk about prioritizing indoor chemistry uh, research and why that is important. Mm. Oops, okay, hold on. Oops, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll figure this out by the time we're, we're done. Um, so from this report, I wanna talk about some main messages. Okay, so we'll start off with some main messages that came from this report. Um, some select recommendations. And the reason why I say select recommendations, there are so many recommendations in this report. Um, I have a copy, a hard copy of the report if people are interested in, in seeing it, but I'll also show you uh, the URL and the QR code you can get that report from. Um, so these are recommendations from why indoor chemistry matters. This is a, a consensus report. So we all read the report, we signed off on the report, and we really wanted to put this report forward so that people had this information and recommendations on next steps forward. Um, so here's a link to the report, um, as well as the um, National Academy website. And so I'll just give everyone a moment if they wanted to use their uh, phones and take a picture and get on the website. Like I said, at any time for people who are here in the room, if they want to look at a copy, a hard copy of the report, I have one that I can uh, share with you. So just uh, look on the National Academy's report um, catalog and why indoor chemistry matters. And so this report was sponsored by a, a number of different uh, sponsors, sponsoring agencies that I just want to mention, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Institutes of Health, mainly the Environmental Health Science Institute, uh, the CDC, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the same foundation that is sponsoring us here today. Uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation has played an important role in indoor chemistry because they had a 10-year plus program, and that really filled the gap in terms of having uh, funds to do research in this area. I will say we have learned a ton uh, in the last 10 years from that support from the Sloan Foundation, building on things that were done earlier, and then advancing the field forward because of that uh, opportunity uh, to do research, to do collaborative research, and to interact with one another. Um, so uh, here's the statement of task. I, I don't want to read it directly to you, but basically um, the Academy has put together uh, an ad hoc committee, uh, so a committee of people from all over the country, scientific experts, to really think about the state of the science regarding chemicals in indoor air. Uh, we wanted to think about underreported chemicals, chemical reactions that occur in the indoor environment, how that transforms chemicals from source to what gets into the air. Um, we wanted to talk about the distribution of chemicals. That's something we talked a lot about. Are these chemicals in the air? Are they on surfaces? Are they in water reservoirs? Are they in dust? Where are these chemicals? And how, why is that important? 
Um, we wanted to put indoor chemistry into the whole context of chemical exposure, air quality, and human health. And so that was some of the driving points of what we wanted to do, and that's what we were asked to do. And while we talked uh, a lot about it with each other, with each other, everything was on Zoom. We never met in person. Okay, so a lot of two-dimensional people that I, I know now uh, in box, small boxes. Uh, the, what, what they wanted us to do was come up with a report with findings and recommendations. So that was our uh, what we wanted to put forward to the community, to everybody, all stakeholders, thinking about uh, what are the opportunities for incorporating what we know now into practice, where additional chemistry research would be needed, what's most critical for understanding the chemistry in indoor environments, what opportunities are there for advancing and addressing um, the technology methods, uh, barriers that are out there? How do we coordinate? How do we collaborate across uh, disciplines? And why is that important? And so again, we wanted to make these recommendations to everybody, uh, to all stakeholders. And I just want to note, we, we did not focus on industrial settings. That falls under the umbrella more of NIOSH, National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health. We focused on non-industrial exposure within buildings. Um, and just here is the committee roster and the, uh, the staff that we worked with. Um, Megan Harries was working at the National Academies at the time. She gave us excellent support. And I just wanted to give her a little bit of a shout out. Uh, some of the slides I to present today, uh, she had uh, developed her talk at the American Chemical Society meeting. And I built on some of that work that she did. Uh, David Dorman, uh, who is a toxicologist from North Carolina State University, was the chair of our committee. He had done several other reports, so he really knew how to lead that effort, if you will. And then we had a number of people. And I will tell you, everybody contributed quite a bit uh, to this report. We all read every word of the report. We all participated and wrote different aspects of the report. So it was a really good committee composed of chemists, engineers, people in, interested in exposure science. So variety of different people. Uh, we needed to listen to each other to understand the different fields in order to put this report together. So why does indoor chemistry matter? Okay, this is the easiest question to answer in my opinion. Indoor chemistry matters because people spend the majority of their time at homes or in other indoor locations. In fact, often the amount of time uh, that is reported that we spend indoors is 90% of our time. Okay, not 40, not 25, not 60, 90% of our time. And we also know there are some people who spend 100% of their time in indoor environments. Given this statement right here, I think just addresses the issue of why does indoor chemistry matter? We need to know what we might be exposed to, what's in the air we're breathing. Um, all these things are important to us because that's where we are. We're, we're mostly indoors. Um, we have been well aware of indoor chemistry for some time. Um, things like radon mitigation. Uh, before I moved to California, I was living in the state of Iowa. If you ever look at a map of where radon is, Iowa is kind of right in the middle and very much highlighted in terms of radon concentrations. I had to have radon mitigation done at one of my houses. Uh, the levels were quite high. They were quite high in our basement, where our, it was a semi-finished basement, where our playroom was, where our kids were playing in, in, during the winter when you didn't go out much and you were down in the playroom, and we had high levels of radon, and we had to do that mitigation. That still bothers me today that uh, that had happened in, in our home because radon is associated with lung cancer. So there's a lot of things that, um, that, that, that worry me in the back of my mind, but something that uh, is done a lot in places like Iowa. In fact, once you have your home mitigated, you, look, you drive around the neighborhood, you drive around the state, you can see everybody, everybody's mitigation. Basically, this is intrusion from uh, the ground, uh, often through uh, lower levels, the basement, and then it's ventilation is basically how, the, how that's mitigated. We all have CO detectors. We change our, we're supposed to check the battery on our detectors twice a year. When we change clocks, I don't know what's gonna happen when we don't do that anymore. Uh, when we go from standard time to uh, daylight saving time, the CO is a, a silent killer. So we know about that and we think about that. More recently, since the coronavirus, people have now been using CO2 detectors. 
um, to think about ventilation, right, uh, in various enclosed spaces in indoor environments and whether there's uh, good ventilation, uh, worrying more now about the coronavirus and, and getting ill because of that. Um, also, people are using particle counters, again, to uh, better understand aerosols and particulate matter in air. So um, the report structure, main messages, and select recommendations, I want to go through that. Um, and so here's our report structure, uh, basically seven chapters. Um, and each chapter provides an overview of the current state of the science, and each chapter provides recommendations of research needs. And I'll be going through uh, some of these chapters as we talk. So to set up this talk, I went to a figure. I, I label all the figures that I show here today and, and where they are in the report. If it's not labeled, it's not in the report, and I give you a reference for a figure. Um, I went way back to figure, I, go to, I went to chapter six, so I went to sort of towards the end um, to get this figure, figure 6.2. I think uh, this is a brilliant figure and it really represents what I wanna talk about today. And basically what this figure does is charts the fate and transport of an agent, a chemical, from source to ultimate impacts on health. And so let's just go through this for a moment, okay? So you have a source, here it is just a spray can, a puff, if you will, of something into the air. Um, this is just one example, there are many. And then you have uh, indoor chemistry and some engineering going on. Okay, uh, these molecules, it just doesn't stay a puff. We all know this, right? It dissipates. That is, it gets transported, okay? Um, and then it starts to partition. Maybe it sticks to surfaces. Maybe it stays in the air. Maybe it's associated with dust. Maybe it's in a water reservoir. And so this back and forth, you know, this, tra this transformation showed by this arrow. I'm a chemist, I kind of want to turn at 90 degrees, if you will, if you know anything about chemistry, but, but, but Glenn says, no, this is the way it should be. Then we want to know what the concentrations are in the indoor environment. Sometimes concentrations are very low, parts per trillion, parts per billion, especially as the agent gets diluted in the, in the air indoors. Um, and so measurement science, analytical tools are key. And what some of these things that were developed during that uh, Sloan program, uh, some of that, the funds were put towards developing instrumentation that can detect chemicals in air at low concentrations. Um, we, then it's what's people being exposed to uh, through dermal, excuse me, skin, uh, ingestion, inhalation. We talk a lot about inhalation, uh, but there are also other routes of exposure. And then the dose. So what's the concentration times time, right? And so that's ultimately what we wanna know in order to understand health effects. So what I will tell you is, we were we had one toxicologist. We had no epidemiologist. We had uh, no MDs on our report. We are focused mainly on what we need to know in order to determine health effects. That's what this report is mainly about. So now this report, that, that, that diagram allows me to kind of color code, if you will, some various points that uh, we'll be talking about. So chapter two mostly focuses on sources and then uh, three and four about transformations and transport and partitioning. And then uh, five about measurement science uh, is in there. And then we have indoor chemistry and exposure. So starting to think about that exposure and that dose. And then a path forward is the last chapter. How do we take all of this together to understand health effects? Okay, so some of the main messages, and then I'll go into the recommendations. Um, one main message is that environmental conditions and indoor chemistry vary between buildings based on their purpose and use. use. A school is different than a home, is different than an office, is different than so for a museum, so forth and so on. So really, um, things are very varied between buildings, again, their purpose and their use. 
Um, in this picture, um, and I, I wrote out some of these things, there are a number of different primary sources and re reservoirs of chemicals indoors in just a single family home. Now, not everybody lives in a single family home. So there's other, there's apartments, there's dwellings, there's uh, high rises, so forth and so on. And so this is just an example. And we're not even talking about like communication between homes and where you can have things happening in one home affecting another or, or in one living area affecting another. Um, a chemical emissions from water. Uh, I go back to my Iowa example and taking a shower and smelling chlorine because something happened at the uh, water treatment plant that they needed to take care of. And uh, there you can smell chlorine. And it, typically you didn't smell chlorine, but you could on certain days. Uh, that would be a chemical emission coming from that water system. Uh, chemicals from building materials is also important. Fumes from attached garage. Intrusion through the foundation, I've already noticed, noted radon as being one uh, type, but there are others. Um, particulate matter, CO, NO2, from gas appliances and cooking, fireplaces and wood burning stoves. I mean, they're designed so that they, you try to minimize that, but these things are still happening. Um, personal care products. Uh, all of us here use personal care products. Everybody uses personal care products. That's a source. Um, met metabolic, metabolic em emissions, I won't talk too much about that. Um, mold and microbes associated with water, uh, flame retardants and plasticizers, cigarette smoke, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of different sources. And this is just one example I'm showing of a single family home. Occupants and their activities impact indoor chemistry. Cooking, cleaning, I say primping and preening, that's a, that's the personal care products I was talking about. Smoking, leading to secondhand smoke. We all know about secondhand smoke. More recently, we've been talking about thirdhand smoke. I think, Charlie, you wrote a great paper in PNAS about that uh, several years ago, right? And that is smoke that ends up on surfaces. And so you can touch surfaces and get exposed to this third hand smoke that undergoes chemistry and changes from the initial secondary smoke, which then, then goes and partitions to a surface. So you may say to your spouse, I'm only gonna smoke in this room and this won't bother you uh, and I'll open the window, but you can still get that secondary smoke and you can still get um, um, some exposure through uh, maybe dermal exposure due to third hand smoke. These are the things that we're learning. These are the things that we're uh, thinking about. And so when I go, et cetera, there's a lot of other activities. Um, another main message is that researchers um, know very little about how humans are exposed to multiple indoor chemicals across phases and pathways and how these uh, joint exposures um, interact across time scales, um, what's their cumulative long-term impacts on indoor chemistry, indoor chemical environment, and human health. We're not exposed to one thing at a time. That's the whole point here. We're exposed to multiple things. Sometimes they react with each other. We have to uh, understand that and we don't know very much. Um, another important message from this, uh, and I've mentioned this already, um, is that indoor surfaces matter. Uh, the number of times uh, mentioned in the report uh, for surfaces is quite high. Chemicals, okay, maybe if you do the word search, you might get different numbers than, than I did. But I, when I did it, chemical or chemicals, I got 1,054. Um, I got uh, 672 when I did aerosols, particles, PM. Um, surfaces 515, gases or gases 239. Um, so aerosols and particles, that's another uh, National Academy's report that came out uh, recently, uh, indoor exposure to fine particulate matter and practical mitigation approaches. Um, and uh, Richard uh, Corsi, a Dean of uh, College of Engineering at uh, UC Davis led that. And so um, that report talks all about particulate matter aerosols. And I'm gonna uh, let you know that report stand as is. Today, I wanna talk a little bit more about surfaces because that's what's unique in this report relative to other reports on atmospheric chemistry or air quality outdoors. Uh, surfaces play a role there too, but surfaces play much more of a role in the indoor environment. And just, you know, I always tell people, just look around the room you're in, whether you're online, look around the room you're in there or in the room here, you can see fabrics and wood and 
glass and shade, you know, all these different types of materials, all these different types of surfaces. And they play an important role in indoor chemistry um, they, uh, um, and, and indoor air quality. They can act as a sink. So, you, okay, good, that gets it out of the air. I don't have to breathe it, um, but it's on the surface you, if you touch the surface. But then what happens is over time, because it was such a good sink initially, it becomes a source, a long-term source. The other thing that a surface can do is you can have transformations. So a, com a chemical compound, when adsorbed to a surface, when sticking to a surface, can change its identity, and so that and, and become a different chemical, potentially a less a, a more benign chemical, potentially not, potentially something that you may want to uh, um, consider when thinking about health effects. Um, another main message had to do with the outdoor environment. So how, and, and this comes up, uh, it will come up in a few slides, how the outdoor environment affects the indoor environment and vice versa. We talked about that quite a bit. Um, and how the outdoor environment is changing due to climate change. In the Western United States where I live now, uh, we have more wildfires. Uh, the wildfire season is longer now, and that is due to climate change. So things are changing um, outdoors, and that's going to impact our indoor environment. Um, new analytical tools have been as I noted already, instrumental in, in having us understand uh, indoor chemistry. Um, and there still remains the key challenges that really to develop this instrumentation requires uh, some strategic investments. You need robust, robust measurements of air, which include gases and aerosols, surfaces, and the dust particles on those surfaces. Um, and that is an important uh, message that came out in our um, deliberations over the many meetings that we had for over a year, uh, bringing this report together. You know, and I've talked to some of you already about this, um, really an ongoing need to effectively translate the scientific knowledge about indoor chemistry into practice and policy. That's something that is really needed. Um, the other point in this report, many chemicals found indoors have little or no information regarding their toxicity, either alone or in combination. And mitigating chemical hazards will require efforts in, and this is a big, this bullet is a big one, okay, in my opinion. Changing build, building design and operation, that's a big ask, right? Altering the use and contents of products and materials, huge ask. Addressing the impact of human activity on indoor chemistry, like having people change how they behave in the indoor environment. One, two, three, those are all really big asks. How can we move forward? How can we start to implement the thinking about these uh, thinking about things differently, changing, altering, addressing. That's really important um, It needs to be done. So what are some of our recommendations from this report? The main messages kind of laid out what these recommendations are. Understanding the chemical composition of complex mixtures that make up our indoor air in a wide range of residential and non-residential settings. That means making measurements in these settings, okay? So that's that's something that we need to consider so we can really understand what's going on. Um, in order to make these measurements, we need to develop these novel methods. I mentioned them already, mass spectrometry, whatever it is that needs to be done, um, and chemoinformatic resources to identify, quantify wide classes of indoor chemicals, primary emissions, as well as those secondary chemical reactions, those transformations. Um, creating emissions inventory specific to building types and identifying indoor transformations that impact outdoor air quality. How do we do that? There's uh, many, many different types of uh, houses, many different types of indoor environments. How do we in fact start thinking about this um, in terms of emissions inventory, uh, creating one? And I think that's a, a, a very important recommendation. Um, in terms of partitioning and transformations, so, so that double arrow, understanding the phase distribution of indoor chemicals between all indoor re reservoirs, and incorporating this knowledge of partitioning into exposure models. Understanding the chemical transformations using advanced techniques, deciphering those mechanisms, 
so that you know maybe not how not to make that uh, transformation if it's a problem, both in the lab and in indoor environments. We do a lot of research in the laboratory, but you always have to check in indoor environments is some similar chemistry going on. It's like atmospheric chemistry. People measure things outside. They do things in the laboratory. Do those agree? Am I doing those experiments in the right way with the right chemicals to simulate what's going on outdoors? Um, this is an important one, and I think it's going to be talked about a lot today, uh, this last bullet, how standardized consensus test methods could, en could enable potential certification programs for air cleaning products and services. That's actually something that's going to be discussed uh, more, and I, I think it's important. So um, when we think about emissions and how they evolve over time and spatial scales, what I want to show here is the fact that uh, we have this diagram, figure 3.2, taken from uh, one of uh, the papers in the literature, Weschler, Weschler and Nazaroff, 2008, modified a little bit. Um, but you know, we think about it in a big picture way, chemicals in the air, what's going on. In order to understand this, we need research like that on the right-hand side. And so uh, that is really diving down into that molecular level detail of what is going on. So to understand this, we need research like this. And so I'm trying to make that connection and make those arrows. Um, in my own laboratory, that, that round circle on the left is just one of a diagram that I used for uh, the, the grant I got funded from the Sloan Foundation. We wanted to look at a lot of different types of chemistry, and we showed it in that uh, diagram. But one of the things we wanted to look at was this molecule called HONO. Uh, uh, nitrous acid. Um, it forms in indoor and outdoor environments. There is some concerns about it um, and from health effects. Also, it dissociates into the hydroxyl radical, which is an oxidant in indoor and outdoor air. And so we wanted to understand that that and, and, and it forms on surfaces. So we wanted to understand that chemistry a little bit. And so we did some surface chemistry of NOx to produce uh, gas phase HONO, and we used different building materials, um, a cement, a uh, painted wall. Uh, we used a clay material, kaolinite that's used in building materials. We used a zeolite. And what we found is that chemistry is different on different surface materials. And in particular, we formed a lot of HONO, nitrous acid on kaolinite and the painted wall, but very little when we had zeolite and cement. So, you know, you can think about a strategy now. If I don't want to produce much HONO in the gas phase, I can use zeolite and cement. Um, maybe. Okay, let me just say maybe for now. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, and the reason why we didn't get any HONO from zeolite and cement is that the deprotonated form nitrite was staying inside of the zeolite, staying inside of the cement, and how it was interacting with those surfaces uh, was very strong, and so you weren't getting that HONO into the gas phase. See the level of detail that I learn things on, okay? And so, but it starts to tell us that different building materials will do things uh, differently. Now, okay, why don't I just say recommend zeolite and cement and never use kaolinite or painted while we have to, um, but what, what would you, um, uh, why do I say, I don't want to say that immediately, because now it stores nitrite. So under what conditions will that get into the gas phase as HONO? Is it high relative humidity? Um, if you're using some, uh, some acids get into the air. And so um, this is just the start of trying to understand how materials uh, interact with uh, nitrogen oxides, especially as they uh, relate to HONO formation. Here's another example. Limonene. This is work all done by funding with the Sloan from the Sloan Foundation. Um, we did a study looking at limonene. This is a, cle a, a cleaning product uh, shown on the left. We looked at it alone. That is, there's only one, one chemical uh, there interacting with a surface. And these are some of the, we worked with uh, Doug Tobias, who does molecular dynamics simulations. We work with Manabu uh, Shirara, who does uh, chemical kinetics. We make the measurements. Um, so that's the graph in the middle on the left-hand side. And what we see is we introduce some limonene uh, to towards uh, like a glass surface. Um, initially, we see a large increase in the coverage on the surface, the so limonene is sticking on the surface. We remove the limonene and then the concentration just goes down. So what happens, we can say this surface is a sink uh, for limonene, but then it's a source, but this is on short time scale. So this is not something that we would worry about too much. 
Uh, the other things I mentioned is that we looked at other surfaces and some surfaces can transform limonene, mainly oxidize it to another form. But what I really want to show you is another experiment we did on the right-hand side. We looked at limonene plus other chemicals in air. And this project was motivated by some of the things that had come out of uh, home chem that uh, um, um, we, Delphine Farmer and uh, uh, Nina Vance, led that effort where we started to look at limonene and maybe bleach, so different cleaning products. And then what could happen is those two, so bleach, HOCl, Cl2, and limonene, it can form gas phase products, mainly oxidation and chlorination products. And what happens now is these gas phase products stick more strongly on the surface than limonene. And that what that means is that then they become long-term sources of these chlorinated compounds, these chlorinated uh, hydrocarbons. And so these are the kinds of chemistry that we see. So the surface interacts more strongly with these chlorination and oxidation products, but what happens is they come off more slow, slowly. So that's it's a sink, but then the surface as a source of these products over time. Some surfaces can tr further transform these products. So details, details, details. Now this came out terrible and I don't know why because it was fine on my computer. Um, but pretty much what we need to do is we need to understand you know, the, the complexities of these surfaces. And I, I was using fairly simple ones. If you look around the room, there are much more complex surfaces, fabrics, for example. Uh, try to understand and probe that chemistry, understand the, uh, we need new approaches, new mechanisms are coming out from those studies, modeling the chemistry of indoor surface and connecting surface chemistry to real world indoor, indoor measurements. And ultimately, you know, going into that, um, figure 6.2, if you will, where I should draw that line over to health effects and try and understand how that impacts health. Okay, um, building and measurement, some recommendations, um, really integrating indoor chemistry considerations into building system design and mitigation approaches. Separate fields, people don't talk as much as they could. Wouldn't it be great? Engineers in consultation with indoor air scientists thinking about buildings, applying and developing new analytical tools. I already mentioned that, probing the chemical complexity, gases, aerosol, surfaces. Um, you know, um, lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, this will be discussed a little bit more, the importance of ventilation and filtration, um, and that cleaning methods can add chemicals into the air. And so uh, a recommendation is that testing methods, standards are needed for commercial air cleaners, both products and processes. And this is a uh, diagram um, from Doug Collins and Delphine Farmers, uh, really nice paper just looking at different methods of cleaning air and what that means in terms of indoor chemistry. Really important work opens our eyes about what do we mean by cleaning. And in fact, oftentimes there's really not a lot known. And so this is really important. So these transformations are coming, uh, they're coming about um, when we use these indoor air cleaners and, and it will be expanded upon those thoughts. Lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cleaning surfaces, not as important as cleaning air through ventilation and filtration for the coronavirus. I think that we can all agree about that. Lessons learned during the CASA experiment that Delphine led, uh, chemical assessment of surfaces and air. Cleaning surfaces with soapy water, mopping and wiping, most important in cleaning air of persistent volatile organic compounds from wildfire smoke and indoor air by removing VOC reservoirs. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, so um, in one case, we're trying to get you know uh, aerosol transmission of COVID, uh, coronavirus. You have to clean the air. That's you want to filter the air. You want to ventilate the air. Here in this particular case, um, wildfire smoke got into a, a house, a test house, the NIST test house, and it was persistent. They ventilated, but the, it was persistent again, came out again, and that's because surfaces were reservoirs for that smoke. Then you clean the surfaces, right, through mopping, wiping, soapy water mopping, wiping, and that removed the VOCs. So 
these lessons are not contradictory. You have to think about ex what you're doing, okay? So in one case, cleaning surfaces really didn't help the situation. In one case, it really, really did. And this is just because of what we're doing, what we're looking at, the processes that are involved. Exposure and health. Here we have exposure pathways. I, I, I like this, uh, this uh, diagram as well from chapter six, uh, inhalation, ingestion, dermal contact. We talked about some of that already. Um, some of the recommendations are centered on really updating national human activity pattern surveys to capture people's activities in indoor environments, understanding indoor uh, exposures to contaminants that are outdoor in origin but maybe undergo transformations, understanding exposure and health impacts on a wide range of indoor settings, uh, future standards, guidelines, or regulatory efforts. And I like this one too, new approaches for measuring exposure in children. They're doing different things. We were just talking about that earlier. And I learned a long time ago talking to um, uh, exposure scientists as well as uh, people in the health field, children are not just small people, okay? They breathe more rapidly. They have different activities. There's so much that are different than, than uh, the larger uh, adult. Um, there really needs to be new approaches for measuring exposure in children. That's a recommendation. In chapter seven, we talked about a path forward, um, recommendations cutting across different topics. I just wanna go to them because I wanna keep us on time. Um, accelerating the field forward, the Sloan Foundation played an important role over the last decade by providing resources, funding um, on a scale that made people able to do research in their labs and collaborate across labs and collaborate on really important field studies, I'll call them, uh, home chem and CASA. And that funding is over, so there's gonna be a gap going on right now as people try to figure out ways to um, continue the work that they're doing. And so I think that we really need a national research priority focused on indoor air and indoor chemistry for the reasons I showed you in one of my first slides. That's where we are. Um, it's important to engage and collaborate and connect um, across the, the indoor chemistry paradigm and across, of course, disciplines. We all need to hear from each other to learn and to move forward. So in collaboration and need to engage across disciplines. This is a complicated slide, but it's, it's really not. Basically what I'm showing you here is an indoor chemistry model on the left and an exposure model sort of on the right. And what I'm saying is, Okay, so one's in chapter four and one's in chapter six. So we need the indoor chemistry model plus the exposure model in order to understand health effects. We need to bring these models together and that's a new paradigm for understanding health effects. It sounds easy, you know, actually adding them together is gonna require some effort, some collaborative effort. How do you put things in your model? In the exposure models right now, it doesn't have those transformations or anything uh, along those lines. And so really bringing these together does represent a new paradigm for understanding health effects. Recognition of this important problem as a national research pri priority, just labeling it again, collaboration and great engagement across disciplines, invest in coordinated interdisciplinary research, application of knowledge. A key takeaway from this report, science and technology is needed from the fundamental to the practical. And so I think that, um, I hope I represented that report well. Others will expand upon different aspects of the report. Um, we tried to really survey the state of the science and provide in many ways through the recommendations a roadmap uh, for moving forward in this very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, important from our health perspective, uh, the field of indoor chemistry. Thank you.
All right. I guess you guys can hear me, right? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be uh, moderating some questions and then a, a panel session after this. And we've got a few questions coming in on the um, chat as well. So I'm going to actually start with my own question, and then we can uh, move on to some from the audience and some from the chat as well. Um, make sure this is on. Okay, so um, I'll start off with a, a broad question. Based on your research experience and experience writing this report, uh, what direction do you see your research heading? So thank you, Glenn, for that question. Um, I, I think there's a couple of, of uh, ways I want to answer that question. So as Glenn noted, my background is in this area of surface chemistry and surfaces. And what I would tell you is that a lot of the molecules we detect indoors, we know very little about how they interact with surfaces. And so... Um, and really, most importantly, with some of the studies I showed you with limonene when you had multiple chemicals involved, I really want to look at this surface chemistry in a realistic environment of the different chemicals that are in the air to better understand what is being formed. So I, I think that partitioning and the, the transformations are something that we can as a group in my research group can help add into this whole field. I'm really interested in the indoor outdoor exchange, how you know things like wildfire smoke can impact uh, uh, the surfaces and the chemistry that occurs in indoor environments. Um, and those are some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, in, in my lab and people in my lab are interested in right now. Cool. Um, are there, uh, if there's questions in the audience, uh, just go ahead and go up to the microphone. Uh, is okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can find check, get one from the chat. So a question from the chat was: Do fragrances and other toxic chemicals change, like secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke, to make additional hazardous chemicals? And I would say that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. And um, oh, wait, could I, so yeah, do they change? Well, do, wait. do fragrances change indoors? I think so. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so trying to understanding those transformations and, you know, they do end up on surfaces. Um, but I think very little no is known about that right now, unless you've done it, Glenn. No, no, no. I, I, well, <laughs> there's no, I, the, the question I was sort of breaking it into two. One yeah. is, do they change and does it matter? Yeah. Um, and so if we don't know what it changes into, we can't say whether it matters or not. And the other thing I want to mention about fragrances we all don't use the same type of personal care products, fragrances, you know, that's, you know, based on a lot of different things that each one of us uses um, in our home. And so being able to really um, look at the broad range of fragrances that are used, I think is something that's really important. And it does add to the indoor chemistry. Fragrances add towards the indoor chemistry and what's going on. So you've uh, collaborated quite a bit with uh, other research uh, groups in the Sloan program. Um, in keeping with this recommendation from the report, which you highlighted, um, where do you see sort of your, where do you see fruitful collaborations occurring for you and your research group? So um, we did get a really wonderful opportunity to collaborate. I mentioned a few, you know, with the, um, uh, the uh, field experiments in different homes, um, modeling, uh, people working in um, modeling of indoor chemistry. Um, so that was and has been completely very fruitful. Every collaboration that we've done, I've learned something from to do the experiments in my lab better and uh, uh, just learning new things all the time. And then moving that forward to what we know from those studies into the exposure models and how do we help make bridge that so we better understand health effects is something that I think would be a really uh, wonderful next step. So really having a group of people in that indoor chemistry paradigm that we kind of talked about and showed, um, everybody at the table, I think, would be very helpful, and I'd like to collaborate with everybody. Okay. <laughs> and we would all like to collaborate with you. Um, so there were several comments that are in the same milieu. Um, I, can, uh, I can ask one or two of them, but I'll start with... Um, 
uh, well, I'll, actually, I'll combine a couple. We can identify many pollutants and contaminants, but do we know the true risk associated with each of or the combination? Why is there no mention of risk or harm, either from acute or chronic exposure? Yeah, so that's the big that's the big question. We don't, and I think I try to point that out. We don't know the risk. We don't know the harm. Okay, that's that was a big part of that report was that we don't know what the risk or the harm what what those are. And so um, I think that uh, was clear in, in the report and in the recommendations of what we need to do next. Okay. So there's another question. Are there instruments to measure chemicals that come into the house or school from outside like dryer fumes coming in from neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, um, so, uh, with the span of instrumentation, yes, there there are definitely instruments that can you know test what you know detect what's in the air. Um, a lot of people use mass spectrometry um, to detect exactly what's in the air. But the uh, if the question is, is there something that I could hand you or you can buy on Amazon? Or I don't I don't think the answer is yes. You know, if it's forming particles, you can get a particle calendar. There's not they're not too expensive. Um, if you're getting uh, CO two, you can get a CO two detector. Um, but the there are instruments but they are not like widely available. They are very specialized instruments right now. And, and that can detect many, many things. And that was some of the beauty of the Sloan program was using these instruments to study indoor chemistry in a variety of settings. So here's a, uh, actually I'm gonna jump to one of my questions and we'll go back to here to one of these. Um, so, I think you've touched on this several times, but um, if you were making the case for fundamental chemistry studies to some of the folks here who are looking at the practical outcomes, you know, the, the folks that are doing um, building management and um, operating uh, schools, you know, and making decisions at that level, you know, how do you argue for the, the fundamental chemistry? So, um, and how does it, it's argued in the report? as yeah. well, yeah. 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 So what I would say is that a lot of the chemicals in indoor environments, um, and I've said it a number of times, we know very little about their chemistry. Okay, we, we know very little about their chemistry. If we want to have uh, uh, the, you know, the best air quality um, in buildings, we're gonna have to know something about their chemistry. Um, I will say that there are chemicals in indoor environments that if you look in the literature, there is not one study, there is not one study, there are zero studies on how those chemicals interact with surfaces. In this report, we talk about the role of surfaces, sinks, sources, a place where things can transform, and I'm telling you that there are some chemicals, many chemicals detected in an indoor environment. We have no knowledge, zero knowledge about how they interact indoors. And so that to me is a situation where you need to build up that knowledge base in order to do the best job of, you know, that one, two, three we mentioned of what needs to be done, how buildings are made, what materials are, are used. We need to understand what's coming off of some of these materials. Again, how are they transforming? How do they capture chemicals and what they do there? So we have no knowledge in some cases, and I think that is not serving anyone well, and so including the building community. Uh, at the microphone. Trey. Thank you. Uh, Trey Thomas, Consumer Product Safety Commission. You just mentioned the, the the devices, the air monitoring devices you can purchase, and some of them are less than $100. You can buy them online. We are beginning to see consumers who are purchasing these. They're making measurements, and I think it's a, a big question, what do we do with the data? So I just wanted to see if you had any insight in terms of their accuracy. Is this good for screening, perhaps? Is there any usefulness for the data that could potentially be generated by these these products? I think you know citizen science is important, um, and I think that uh, we should be uh, utilizing that more and more. But people, your CO two uh, counters measuring three thousand, I think it's parts per thousand. 
uh, open a window, uh, turn on a fan, you know, it, it's telling you something. If you want to have more ventilation, if you're worried about things like coronavirus, it's telling you something. Part particular matter, you're cooking something and you have your fan on low, let's say, or don't have it on and your particle counter is going off, you turn on that fan, you can see the response. If, you're, if your filters are clogged, you, you know, it's not responding, it tells you something what you can do. You have actions that you can do that can help you and, and it makes the air quality better um, where you are. So there is some use perhaps. There's definitely some use. And I really, like I said, I do believe in citizen science. So how can we get more uh, of that to citizens? I think um, we've learned over time in many cases, I, you know, a Flint, Michigan, um, various cases that if people were able to make measurements of things, they could have been in a lot better situations. Thank you. All right, we'll do uh, one more chat question. Um, PM and aerosols provide available and high surface area for gaseous chemicals. How would you consider to address this aspect? So, um, exactly right. And so there's surface chemistry going on on particle surfaces, particulate matter and aerosol surfaces. I didn't talk about that too much today, but that is something that people do look at. That's how particles grow. You know, gases uh, stick to the surface of these aerosols of these particles. That, in fact, is how, in some ways, uh, secondary organic aerosols grow indoors, is through that chemistry happening at the surface. And so you make, you make a great point. I focus today mainly on stationary surfaces, but also uh, particulate matter and aerosols also matter. Well, thank you, uh, Vicki. And let's all thank Dr. Grassian for the presentation. Thank you. All right, I get to introduce the next speaker. <clears throat> so I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Barbara Turpin, who is a professor at the University of North Carolina in environmental sciences and engineering. Her expertise is in aerosol science, atmospheric chemistry, and environmental engineering. She's a Caltech graduate and has her, received her PhD at the Oregon Health and Science University. She combines laboratory experiments, chemical modeling, and field research to improve the understanding of linkages between air pollution emissions and human exposure. Through her research, she seeks to reveal fundamental processes needed to accurately predict human exposures to airborne contaminants, both outdoors and indoors. Um, she's been well known uh, uh, for her work on the formation of organic particulate matter through aqueous chemistry, but also for many other uh, studies. And in the indoor field, quite well known for her work on what was called the REOPA study, which um, was one of the uh, early really intense studies of many, many indoor environments and studying the chemistry taking place there. Um, she's received numerous awards, including the Hagen Schmidt Award, Schmidt Award and is a fellow of AAAR, the American Geophysical Union, and AAAS. She has been editor or on the editorial board for several journals and has given numerous plenary and keynote presentations. Interestingly, she was a member of the US fencing team and was a national champion in 1992. She's also an outstanding colleague and is one of, one of the reasons I chose to move to the University of North Carolina in 2017. So let's welcome Dr. Turpin. Probably one of the most important things I did as department chair is figure out how to get Glenn there. So very happy about that. So it's my pleasure today to talk to you about um, uh, sources indoors. And if I can figure out how to make this work. Is it this one? All right, you already know that um, the indoor environment is a really important exposure location because we spend a lot of time indoors, uh, unfortunately, because I really prefer the outdoors myself. 
And not only that, we are often in close proximity to source emissions that we, because we're generating them through our activities. There's um, limited dilution of those sources. So that means that the concentrations are higher than we would like. And there's a complex and evolving mix of chemicals um, from many different sources that include human activities, consumer products and materials, chemical reactions, biological processes, and the outdoor air. And one big challenge that we have is that because you know, there's proprietary information about products that makes it difficult to know, you know, even for me as an informed citizen, I don't know what I'm bringing into my home when I buy things. That drives me a little bit crazy. Um, just like when we deal with outdoor air, we have both primary and secondary sources and primary means chemicals that are emitted directly from let's say cooking, for example, or perhaps volatilization from surfaces. By secondary, I mean emission of chemicals that are formed through indoor chemistry. And this could be, um, you know, some of the things we probably know the, the most about is when um, ozone uh, reacts with surfaces, your skin lipids, for example, and some, you know, it's going to um, oxidize, but also fragment those compounds. And um, some of them will be volatile and they'll be emitted from your skin then. I'm gonna talk both about sources to indoor air and a little bit about how the indoor environment, you know, how you can think of, okay, I am an engineer. So you can think of the indoor environment as a little reactor. And to some ex extent, we're bringing air in from outside, we're processing and changing it, and then emitting air to the outside. So I'll talk a little bit about indoors as a source to outdoor air. Okay, well, um, one thing, so there have been some really high quality scientists working in this field for a very long time, but a small number of them. And we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years because a bunch of new scientists and new instrumentation and new ideas have come into that field, there's been more money invested in research in indoor air. One of the things we've known for a long time it is that um, gas phase hydrocarbons, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, are um, at much higher concentrations indoors than outdoors. And really, um, this is a really good indicator that uh, there are significant indoor sources. So chemicals with higher indoor concentrations have significant indoor sources. We also now know that um, oxidized VOCs or water soluble organic gases are at much higher concentrations indoors than outdoors, meaning that they're indoor sources, right? So this is a study of uh, 13 homes in North Carolina and New Jersey. And the red, it's the indoor concentrations, and the gray is uh, our measurements from immediately outside of those homes. You can see they're more than 10 times higher. So in this case, we've measured total water-soluble organic uh, carbon in the gas phase. And the reason we did this is then to try and understand how much of that material do we really know anything about. So what are the chemicals that make up that that mass. And so I want to point to the value of doing a mass balance um, in order to see, you know, what, what do we know and what do we not know? How much, to what extent do we understand the big picture? So these um, figures are from the CASA campaign, which took place at NIST. Uh, thank you, Dustin. And um, at their zero energy test house. And there we found that the indoor WSOC uh, concentrations in the gas phase were about 20 times the concentrations outdoors. And um, on the left there, you see a mass balance on the house background. So this is when there are no people in the house and there are no purposeful activities going on. It's just the house. And the concentrations were quite high. I was surprised at how they, high they were. Um, but we can identify most of the mass, at least more than half of the mass, using um, mass spectrometer, mass spec tools. I think 
uh, these measurements are probably from John Abbott's group. On the right, uh, Delphine Farmer's group also did an experiment where we simulated um, the infiltration of uh, wood smoke to think about what would happen if there was a wildfire nearby. And we also did a mass balance on that. Now I can kind of guess what some of the rest of the mass is because I've also worked on um, uh, wildfire characterization, smoke characterization. So we do know a little bit more about this but you can see that there's a lot of the mass missing when we use our standard um, high quality uh, tools. I wanna also point to the real value of real time measurements in locating, pinpointing, or identifying sources. So here's one example. Um, this is a home where we ran um, some perturbation experiments in a way, uh, we uh, in this day on this day we did we cooked breakfast three times. Okay, and so um, when I first did a mass balance on water soluble organic carbon, we found lactic acid, a fair amount of lactic acid, and I said, "Oh, that's from people." But here we can see the dotted line here and here and here when we were cooking bacon and eggs. Lactic acid is really high. So now we know probably that lactic acid comes from the bacon, cooking the bacon. That makes sense to me. Um, there are a small but significant number of uh, studies now where um, real-time mass spectral methods have been used in the indoor air study. And these are very, very informative um, for many reasons. Here's another example. Um, uh, mass spectral methods have really high um, sensitivity to chemicals, to individual chemicals. And so we can even measure um, trace concentrations of really concerning chemicals um, when in the process of uh, doing, performing indoor activities. And so we got about three or four different brands of microwave popcorn. We microwaved them and um, with, you know, of course the oven door, microwave oven door closed, which you have to do to get it to operate, right? That's a good thing. Um, and we left our chemical ionization mass spec running this um, uh, about six feet from the microwave. And um, you can see the emission of 6,2-FTOH. So this is a poly, a per, you know, a PFAS compound. Um, it's a fluorinated alcohol. And, um, and you can see the parts per trillion values of emissions from only one, you'll be glad to hear, it's only one of those three or four brands that we tested, but repeatably. Okay, organic particulate matter is also about twice as high indoors than outdoors, indicating that there are indoor sources of organic particulate matter. So this is from the REOPA study. And so it's a little bit old at this point, but still useful. Um, we measured in uh, 300 homes in the United States in Elizabeth, New Jersey, Houston, Texas, and Los Angeles County, California. So these are New Jersey data, and I'm showing the um, PM 2.5 mass balance for the, immediately outside of those homes and then inside of those homes. And so as the outdoor air comes in, um, the concentrations, you know, material is lost, particles are lost as they go into the building and they're lost through deposition inside of the building. You can see that the concentrations here in parentheses, the concentration of sulfate, in indoor air is lower than in outdoor air. And the concentration of particulate organic matter though is more than twice what it was outdoors, right? Concentration of elemental carbon is lower indoors than outdoors. So anyway, what this tells me is, yes, of course, particles are lost as they come indoors, they're lost through deposition indoors, but when they're indoor sources, as there are in, in the case of organic particulate matter, then the concentrations are higher indoors. 
<clears throat> when we take apart that data, so we factor the indoor PM concentrations into um, the material that came from outdoors and the material that comes from indoors, and I'll, I'll spare you the details as I don't have time. Um, you can see that, uh, again, that um, this blue fraction that's called other is um, much smaller in the uh, indoor PM of outdoor origin. We didn't measure nitrate. So that other is mostly water and nitrate. And I think what's happening here is that there's a lot of ammonia in indoor air. The ammonia partitions to surfaces. We know this now. And when you bring those particles in from outdoors, um, nitric acid in the gas phase gets sucked up into the walls and that pulls nitrate out of the particles, okay? But you can see also that the, oh, no, 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 where am I going? I'm going, here we go. You can see also that the indoor, indoor generated PM 2.5 is mostly organic. Okay, who cares? Um, what are the potential implications of this? So, you know, we, we do know that there are health effects associated with PM 2.5, adverse health effects. Um, and there are also some other more subtle things that could be going on um, that, um, you know, that we really ought to know about. So per, uh, organic particulate matter, we know that um, organic compounds do tend to partition to organic particulate matter in, in the outdoor environment. That's in part how secondary organic aerosol forms. And so e this emitted organic particulate matter could be a vehicle for the transport of reactive chemicals or toxic chemicals into the lower lung in the indoor environment. And it could alter the fate in general of those chemicals. We know there's a, a paper from Yelena Nomova from a, uh, the early 2000s that um, shows that as PAHs come in from outdoors, they uh, repartition between the gas and the particle phase. So more of those PAHs ends up in the particle phase indoors and that's associated with carbonaceous aerosol concentrations. And so this provides some evidence for that, um, but we don't know a lot else, right? How does this additional PM 2.5 affect the partitioning of things like uh, reactive oxygen species or toxic chemicals like PFAS? Um, and, and how does that, we expect then that that would alter their fate. Ammonia concentrations are much higher indoors than outdoors, indicating an indoor source, about a factor of 10 or so, probably, in homes. So in the CASA campaign, um, our, my colleagues injected uh, ammonia three times in one day, and you can see it here on the screen. If all of the uh, ammonia that we injected into the home uh, remained in the gas phase, then the concentrations would be up here in green, right? But we measured that ammonia, and what we measured was down here in yellow. So what happened to all that ammonia? We believe that it partitioned, probably reversibly, we don't know for sure, to indoor surfaces. And so that the indoor surfaces are a huge reservoir for ammonia. So at the end of the 24 hour day where we did this injection three times, um, about 70 or 80% of the injected ammonia was in those house reservoirs. That's huge, right? Um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, an advocate for water, I would say, in the environment, in both the outdoor environment and the indoor environment. Um, and so I find it really interesting, you know, I've been wondering like, um, how does water on all these surfaces affect chemistry and partitioning? And does it even affect chemistry and partitioning in indoor air? We try not to let the humidity get too high indoors. 
But we did this experiment both on a high relative humidity day, 70%, and a lower relative humidity day, 40%. I know in some parts of the country, the humidity is much lower than that. And um, when we did our best job to fit the data with a model, the best fit model, including reversible surface reservoirs, says that the surface reservoirs for ammonia were 50% larger on that high relative humidity day. So to me, that tells me that there's enough surface associated water in the indoor environment to make a difference to partitioning and probably to chemistry. Okay, who cares, right? What are the potential implications of all that ammonia in indoor air? Well, when ammonia gets sucked up into surfaces, it changes the pH of the surface. And um, that will affect partitioning. So acids, like acetic acid, there's a lot of that in indoor air, get pulled into the surface also. Nitric acid would be another example. But also bases come off that surface. So nicotine, for example, comes off the surface. That's something that we do know from previous work. But there's, there really is still, now we know how ammonia works and that it's important indoors, but there's really a limited quantitative understanding of the impact of ammonia on indoor air. Okay, recently I've been doing research on PFAS outdoors and in indoors, largely um, the, our state government got us involved in that and I'm, I'm glad that they did. It's been a very interesting project and we have a lot left to do. Um, so these are, uh, the plot here shows 26 ionic PFAS species. These are carboxylic acids, sulfonates and PAPs. And um, what we found is that, um, let's see, we did a study of 10 homes in North Carolina and that um, the concentrations of ionic PFAS are two or three times higher indoors in these uh, uh, single family homes than they are immediately outside those homes. And they're a factor of 10 higher indoors than they are in the regional outdoor background. Okay, so we know there are sources of ionic PFAS in homes. Uh, we also measured nine neutral PFAS. So these are FTOHs and FOSIs. Okay, and the concentrations of ionic PFAS in homes are on the order of picograms per cubic meter, but neutral PFAS are nanograms per cubic meter, much higher concentrations. So we think there are sources of those indoors as well. This should come as no surprise. So these PFAS per and polyfluoral alkyl substances are manufactured chemicals. Why do they make them? Yes, they make them for firefighting foams, but mostly they make them for use in consumer products. So you'll find they're probably in the carpet here and on the seat cushions, I'm guessing. Okay, um, we're, I, I would say lucky that um, there's been a fair amount of work, relatively speaking, in trying to um, characterize the concentrations and the species of PFAS present in consumer products. Okay, but what, one of the things we don't really know is how do you predict emissions from um, what's in those products. Um, there is a challenge in terms of understanding, you know, there's kind of an evolving formula uh, in terms of what, uh, what is manufactured and what is put in the products. Um, there are more than 10,000 PFAS species that have been measured somewhere in the environment. Um, so what are the major sources to indoor air, you know where where is the the air con where are the air concentrations of PFAS coming from, and what influences their partitioning? 
uh, two particles and two dust and two indoor surfaces? Um, what processes and pathways drive indoor concentrations and exposures and emissions to outdoors, for example? And are buildings a significant source of PFAS to the outdoor air? Okay, surfaces can have a huge impact on air concentrations. There are large losses um, of uh, compounds from the air and also Surfaces can be a source, but they can also be a reservoir that then releases those compounds later. So this is, um, you know, the the impact of sources of surfaces is much larger indoors than it is outdoors. So this is an example um, we measured with the chemical ionization mass spec in one home. Um, uh, these are the major water soluble gases uh, present. We believe. Um, acetic, formic, and lactic acid there. And every time, the every, about every hour, this was summertime, about in North Carolina. Remember anyone has been there, right? It's more humid than it is here. And you have to run your air conditioner or your house molds, I, I believe, somebody told me that. Um, so every time the acetic and formic acid peak drops, that's because the air conditioner was turned on. And when it raises, comes up again, that's when the air conditioner turned off. So I believe that the losses of these water soluble gases occur in the AC system, probably to um, damp um, surfaces. They increase again rapidly, probably because they're coming off of surfaces that are serving in the building that are serving as reservoirs for these uh, gases. Okay. So indoor surfaces, in the indoor environment, the surface to volume ratios are really high compared to the outdoor environment. Indoor surfaces, the surface soiling um, or the surface films on those surfaces, and then surface associated water are all really important parts of the system. They provide, in some cases, sinks or reservoirs for chemicals, and also primary and secondary sources of chemicals. Um, I just stuck this slide over here, too, to remind myself and you that some of those surfaces come in very close contact with us, right? And so Part of our work, for example, has been looking at um, how PFAS in the air partition to initially clean non-treated clothing and provide perhaps an opportunity for dermal exposure. This could happen with other chemicals as well, phthalates, for example. And um, in any case, an important thing about surfaces is that surface reservoirs prolong the residence time of chemicals indoors. And that allows much more time for reactions to occur because out indoor air doesn't spend that much time indoors. Okay, and so that provides an, an excellent opportunity for secondary, uh, for chemistry to take place and for emissions of new chemicals from surfaces. We know that so surface soiling and water alter partitioning. We really don't understand their role in chemistry. Um, it, it certainly could be that uh, windows are a great place for chemistry because we have sunlight coming in and we could be producing radicals on those soiled surfaces that then react with the chemicals that land there and produce other things. Okay, there is an excellent opportunity to use real-time mass spectral methods to measure emission rates with excellent sensitivity. And so some of my colleagues have done this in real buildings. They bring a little uh, uh, reactor basically, and they stick it right on the surface, the real indoor surface. They'll run something through like ozone or something like that to simulate the oxidation and then measure the products coming off. This is a great idea. 
we weren't quite as clever. And so in my lab, we um, uh, put together a little flow reactor. We put uh, rain jackets in it, you know, uh, waterproof rain jackets. And we measured the PFAS, FTOHs, coming off those rain jackets. These are um, these neutral PFAS, um, fluorotelomer alcohols, are byproducts of the production of um, the carboxylic acids, the, the PFAS like um, P, PFOA and PFOS, these compounds that they're trying to produce for to make the rain jacket waterproof. But it turns out there's there's a lot of these neutral PFAS present as well. So understanding, so um, I think about trying to understand an environment as an importantly inter iterative process. We need to go to the real environment and make measurements to build hypotheses about how things work. Then we have to test those hypotheses in controlled experiments. In the case of the indoor environment, because of the complexity, we really need to do that, um, maintaining some of the complexity of the indoor environment. And a really nice thing about in studying indoor environments is while indoor environments are diverse and complex, it's much easier, it's actually possible to control the operation of the building to make, uh, to tweak and perturb things in the building to test our understanding of the chemistry. And I think that's really important. Okay, just, I know I'm about out of time here, it looks like, um, but I wanted to point out that buildings are also a source of chemicals to the outdoor environment. So we've looked at this a little bit for PFAS very recently and, um, we can see that for one single family home, the emissions of nine neutral PFAS are much greater than the emissions of 26 ionic PFAS. Um, to me, actually, this tells me we may be missing a bunch of PFAS coming from the manufacturing plants because they measure a lot of emissions, mostly of ionic PFAS, and tend not to report. We wanted to compare our emissions from all of the homes, single family homes in the United States to emissions from some other source. And we can't find these neutral PFAS in the emissions inventory for the manufacturing plant. Um, and this is an excellent case for a mass balance. You know, there are 10,000 or more PFAS out there somewhere. How much of the mass are we capturing? What are we missing? You know, um, that's, you know, just an example of things that we need to do. Okay, so I think that, you know, we, we 10 years ago, I would say we, we had a, a foundation of a very small number of very good scientists working in this field. There was an influx of energy and uh, funding for research over the last 10 years that's brought many more people into the field and um, uh, new instrumentation. We've made a lot of progress actually in understanding the underlying drivers of chemical dynamics and progress in developing and demonstrating tools and methods. Um, but we really need a uh, to develop a quantitative, actionable understanding of environmental, the indoor environment, um, and that will benefit from this iterative process of uh, really testing our understanding with models in realistic settings and comparing those model results with measurements. We also, in order to do that, will really need to identify sources and measure emission rates. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. I'm sure I'm out of time. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Barb. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, Linda's going to uh, pull up some of the the uh, chat questions. Again, if you have a question that you'd like to ask uh, Dr. Turpin, please come to the microphone. Um, so, uh, so right now, how does our current um, understanding of chemical complexity inform your research program? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that um, what it means for me is that I can't just uh, come up with a hypothesis that I test in the lab in with simple systems, right? When, um, you know, doing controlled experiments is really important to under developing understanding and testing your understanding. But those controlled experiments really have to happen either by bringing the complexity of the indoor environment into the lab or bringing the lab into the indoor environment, you know, making use of those, making sure that, for example, if you're studying um, chemistry on surfaces, you're using authentically soiled surfaces. Um, that's, anyway, that comp uh, accounting for that complexity is the only way I think that we'll move forward in, a, uh, in an actionable and quick way. Okay, um, uh, Trey. Yeah, uh, excellent talk. Uh, question, in the early 2000s with the PFAS, and we focused on the PFAS and PFOA, the longer chain sort of precursors like the C8s, and there was a, I guess, a push to go to the shorter chain and less toxic and hopefully less toxic. What are you seeing now? Are you seeing these shorter chains or are you seeing fragments of the polymers uh, particularly in, in these airborne exposures. Yeah, we um, the, our measurements for PFAS really started um, recently. Um, and uh, the, the long chain acids and sulfonates are still there. Um, we know that um, FTOHs, for example, uh, these fluorotelomer alcohols, um, are oxidized by OH radicals to form acids. Mm -hmm. And so we suspect that in the outdoor air, the PFAA, the PFOA, for example, is still present in outdoor air probably because of photochemistry, okay? Um, um, so yes, in indoor air and in outdoor air, we see these legacy compounds and we also see the new compounds as well. Thank you. Uh, so we're running out of time, but um, there was a related question um, that, that was, um, have you looked for ultra short PFAS? Oh, yeah. yes. Um, yes. Um, actually, I'm really pleased at how many standards we were able to get. We always want more and they're expensive. But um, yes, we see the, like, the new compounds as well as the legacy longer chain compounds. Right. Uh, I think we have to move on to the break now. We um, have a break, a 15 minute break, and we will return at 10.50. Oh, hi everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the next uh, session. We have um, a panel discussion related to this, um, this broader session on chemical complexity. We're calling it assessing chemical complexity in indoor environments. And we are joined in this panel, um, but I'll go straight down the, the line here. Robin Dodson, Associate Director of Research Operations and a research scientist at the Silent Spring Institute. Vito Alacqua, Acting Director of the Center for Scientific Analysis, Office of Radiation and Indoor Air, Office of Air and Radiation, US Environmental Protection Agency. Zhao Yu Lu, uh, Senior Physical Scientist at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And Barb Turpin, professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, so I will be asking, I'm moderating the session. I'll be asking some questions of the panel, some specific, some broad. Um, the uh, folks online or here can also ask questions. If you'd like to pose a question, come to the microphones. We'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time. We have about 25 minutes to do the panel. So we'll see what we can get to. Um, all right, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is start with um, uh, 
this question, um, and I'm going to uh, start with Robin because he's right, right, right next to me, uh, give me some thoughts here. Um, do we know enough about the chemical composition of indoor environments to assess exposure and make recommendations for safe practices? Yeah, so I, that's a it's a hard question. Um, I think we don't know enough yet. I think there's a lot to learn, um, as I think the both speakers this morning had, had uh, talked about. Um, there's still a lot to learn, but I don't think that that necessarily means there's not time for action or or kind of prioritizing some um, recommendations. Um, I think particularly people want to know what they can do. Um, and I think that we have enough information um, to provide that to folks. Um, and I think we should, even in the kind of operate in this area of kind of not yet knowing the you know definitive answer that we need to move forward um, and continue to do the work, but also still providing some real practical information to people um, in their homes and, you know, people are really concerned about their exposure. So um, keep on going, but we need to get it out there, what we do know. When you say practical information, that we are, like what? Can you just give me a couple of examples? No. So, I mean, I do a lot of home-based studies with uh, folks um, and we always sit down and have these conversations of, you know, we might share with them what their levels were in their house and they want to know, well, what can I do about it? Um, so even things like, you know, leaving your shoes at the door and increasing ventilation if that's appropriate. Um, people want to know that now, and we need to communicate that as scientists. We need to communicate um, what we're finding, right? So Vicki had mentioned, like, she's not going to go out and recommend certain building materials necessarily just yet, but maybe we can start kind of pushing things in that direction to provide evidence-based or empirically-based um, uh, tips, recommendations for homeowners. Okay, yeah. great. Does anybody else want to uh, speak to this broad question about um, making recommendations for safe practices? Uh, I can um, just uh, follow up with what Robin said. Uh, for example, EPA, we have those uh, voluntary programs such as the uh, um, uh, uh, did, uh, Safer Choice program, also designed for environmental capacity size and the uh, uh, program like that. Also, we have the indoor air school uh, kids. Uh, those are good uh, programs to, uh, okay. to, to help the people to be aware of the uh, indoor air quality issue. Great. Um, I wanted to point out, and I meant to mention this before, that we were supposed to have uh, John Abbott, uh, a professor from the University of Toronto on the panel as well, but he couldn't make it because uh, he was ill. Um, but he did actually answer this question um, in absentia. So I thought I would uh, uh, provide that answer from him. Um, so the question was, what do we know about chemical composition and recommendation? So he said, we know a lot about some commonly recognized pollutants, increasingly so with the deployment of low cost sensors. However, the recent advances in sophisticated analytical instrumentation have demonstrated the very high degree of chemical, com chemical complexity that exists indoors, strongly suggesting that there is a lot we don't know. There is true, it, this is true, not only with respect to primary pollutants, but in particular to secondary ones formed by chemical transformations. And we'll discuss more about that uh, later today, uh, transformations. Uh, many of these species are challenging to detect, even with today's instrumentation, highlighting the need to continue to deploy the latest advances in analytical chemistry indoors. And we'll probably make the point too that despite the fact that they're, it can be difficult to detect, they still that does not mean that they're um, meaningless, You know that they still have meaning in terms of, they may have meaning in terms of health. All right, so um, let's uh, see, are there any, uh, okay. I will uh, continue my line of questioning. Um, so, what analytical techniques and tools uh, could advance our understanding? And you can be broad about this, but um, about what you're thinking, about the tools that you think we should be deploying and where and how we should be deploying them. And think of what I'll do is um, jump over to Barb for this question. Here we go. <laughs> That's funny because I just thought of my answer to the last question. So oh, well, well, you, go. you may you may retrospectively <laughs> answer that question. Are you are you thinking that? Um, I was going to 
be a little bit of obnoxious perhaps and say as a consumer, well, so first with my science hat on, I'll tell you that, you know, the most effective way to, the most effective way to clean the indoor air is to find the sources and remove them, right? And as a consumer, I find it kind of surprising and a little bit annoying that actually that um, we let companies make all these products where we, we don't make them, test them for emissions, right? So how come I bring products into my home with no idea what they're emitting into my air? Um, that seems, you know, kind of wrong to me. So it, I think it would be wonderful if we could solve that problem. So, so Maybe that's not easy to solve. So the we, we do do emissions testing of some things, mm -hmm. but maybe the, I guess the majority of things that make come in our homes have, we don't do emissions testing on. Is that That's true. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's with that in mind, what kind of um, instrumentation do you think we're, we should be deploying more or um, to help us understand this complexity? Yeah, I think there's a good role for um, a tiered approach. Um, you know, when we bring these real time, um, highly sensitive instruments into an indoor space, we're, we're looking at one or two spaces at a time, right? We're, you can't just do that anywhere. It's a big imposition to bring those big instruments into a building, especially a home. Um, and that means that we're not really studying the diversity of spaces that we have. And um, we're probably overstudying um, sort of if we're talking about homes, middle income or upper income homes, right? Um, so I think we do need a, a tiered approach where we have, where we cover a lot of um, buildings with some measurements. And so those are probably integrated samplers um, or, you know, low cost sensors and things like that. And then you can benchmark um, against that. So, um, you know, you can do a small number of highly uh, controlled um, experiments in real spaces that fit within that exposure framework. And you can kind of understand um, and accommodate um, the diversity of spaces in that way. Yeah, I'll push the button yeah. um, here. And, and maybe it's a more general comment that a lot of the people here know about, but bears repeating for uh, more in general. So one of the successes that um, we have had in uh, in later years and all the progress that's been pointed out to us, it's it's been really from uh, the um, idea of bringing outdoor instruments indoors that was pioneered by the Sloan Foundation um, earlier efforts. And, and I think that's uh, something that we want to continue to pursue in terms of, we have already a lot of the tools to characterize what we want to, to know. It's, uh, it's, it, there, are, there are challenges, of course, but we want to move away from this uh, uh, situation where indoor air or indoor air chemistry is sort of the ugly stepsister to uh, ambient air because ambient air is regulated and so we have need for investments. We want to have the same understanding uh, that we have for outdoor air, bring it in indoors and, uh, and those instruments that may be useful. Yeah, I just want to add too is the um, importance of developing tools like non-targeted analysis um, to, to, for discovery, basically, of what's indoors. With that is not only working with a great chemist to do that, but also you have to deal with the data side too. And I think we need to continue. When I think of you originally asked this as like tools, I thought it's not only just like instrumentation um, and maybe even like the instrumentation they might have in the lab, uh, mass spec and other um, instruments, but then also the tools, the statistical tools to actually interpret and understand 
the huge amount of data that is produced um, with that those kind of methods. Um, I think that needs to have developed in collaboration and kind of in hand in hand um, as we kind of think about how we could really tackle understanding the complexity indoors. So actually, I'm going to take a look. So are there? OK, I haven't looked at these, so I want to take a look quick on the. Um, so this is a very specific question. Um, Oh, sure. I'll get to you after this question. Okay, yeah. Um, how do we fill the gap between PFAS currently being measured and the greater than 10,000 out there using current technology? So, uh, Zhao Yu, did, did you want to speak to that? Um, so, uh, I think, uh, yeah, well, there are a lot of PFAS. Um, it's, it's very, actually, it's not realistic to study individual ones uh, all the time. But uh, we have information about the uh, some of those uh, uh, PFAS. We also we can use non target analysis to uh, detect more, uh, understand more of the their source, fate, and transport. We also have the uh, uh, sc uh, suspected screening mode mass spectra, uh, which combine enhance the um, traditional methods with uh, computational. Um, assessment, uh, prediction, or data analysis, uh, that will help uh, to enhance the pace of the chemical uh, assessment. I think. So, so with non-targeted analysis, the, the species have to get to the detector, right? So mm -hmm. it's a little bit more than that. So are there techniques that uh, help you capture the broader range that of uh, the PFAS that have different physical properties? I'm not aware of that right now. No, I don't. But right. that's something definitely will be interesting. Other thing is like for emission testing or source characterization or a mechanism study, you may want to think about the AI technique uh, and also the remote controlled robot, uh, like uh, robots, those kind of things. Yeah. Interesting. Barb, did you want to? Well, there are methods that are pretty pretty new, but to measure, so you extract the organic compounds and then measure all the fluorine in those organic compounds um, through IC, for example. That's one way to do it. So, uh, Dr. Thomas? Yeah, kind of a provocative question. And tiered, you know, we have a lot of data gaps. And one way that we talked about meeting them is through models. And part of it, you need data, robust data, you know, for a model. So one, is that still an approach? And two, can we use AI and machine learning tools? We're seeing this in other informatics areas that help us to collect and share data. And actually, can it help with the modeling? So the question is collecting the data and are these new tools that are coming online a way that we can help to meet, develop robust models and meet data gaps. Well, I can speak to the measurement part, not the AI part necessarily. Um, but I would say that I, there are data gaps. And I would say, unfortunately, I mean, I do a lot of work in the SVOC space. So flame retardants, PFAS, phthalates. Um, and part of the reason uh, getting, getting measurement data is really hard. <laughs> um, and it's expensive. It takes time. Um, I think it's very worth it because I think as, as I think Barbara actually did a great job in her presentation kind of talking about how we need this, you know, I, I guess in the report, it's called a three stooled kind of approach, right, but that we need to have this kind of iterative talking between the models and the, um, and the experiments and the measurements. Um, and so I would urge us as there are data gaps to actually keep providing the resources to continue to collect the measurements, because I think that's going to be very important to inform any of the other aspects. And what I mean by that is that we go into people's homes and we find, say, phthalates, and the levels in indoor air are orders of magnitude, right? I mean, like thousand time fold between the lowest level and the highest level. And that's that's tricky. <laughs> like, we have to ask why. And then cramming that into a model <laughs> is 
tricky too, right? Like, do you represent the, the middle of it? Do you represent the high-end exposure? So um, I think we need to continue to try to address some of those data gaps by continuing to collect the measurements, even though it's a hard thing to do. Add something else too. I, I think that's a very worthwhile question to ask how we can use AI techniques. And I, I definitely second your thoughts on uh, measurement because that's really the basis from where we start. I think we're just feeling our way around this point on what is possible, but what has been shown lately in terms of progress is really uh, manipulating language and manipulating language certainly has its purpose here. The, we were talking before about how do you get the information to researchers that about things that are being measured? How do you find it? This, this is a whole um, open field of possibilities really when uh, you have so many different compounds that are being measured in so many different contexts may not be someone who's really interested in indoor chemistry, but on a particular product or a particular. So there, there's certainly a scope there. If we are talking about helping us understanding, that's a whole different level of, uh, uh, of process. And I think there was an interesting National Academy's uh, workshop on, uh, on, on the use of AI to make science. and. Uh, the 2050 challenge to do uh, to do use AI for a Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery. I think there's scope there, but we really need to build the infrastructure of it, including the uh, chemoinformatics way of storing the data in a way that can be used by these by these other tools. So talking about the machine learning, I think the uh, one of the application is the QSAR model. For example, for PFAS, uh, we don't know the chemical, uh, physical chemical property for a lot of uh, PFAS. So, so if we have some experiment data, we can use, uh, uh, Q, we can develop QSAR models through machine learning. I think that's a good way. So the uh, QSAR models are, um, there could they be combined? I mean, I guess with you know AI and in, in a way to sort of bootstrap that more rapidly. Okay, okay, good. Um, so, so this sort of is leading towards this this question. We've been talking about measurements and and sources and source control and things like that, but. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, how we deal with this from a regulatory perspective. So, um, you know, what regulatory mechanisms do we have right now for guiding complex sources? I mean, uh, do we, what do we have that, that's either doing it directly or indirectly? Um, anybody can jump in on this. Um, so I, I... I think we need to be a little bit, try to be a little clever in this space about what are the regulatory mechanisms. I think there are things like Tosca and EPA can tell us which chemicals can actually be used in the products. Um, we could think about source control and thinking about what actually chemicals can go in building materials and things like that. One thing that I do think, an area that I think that we could make some headway is thinking about um, kind of the green building space or the energy efficiency space and those certification programs um, indirectly, right? So for example, HUD requires a certain amount of their properties to meet certain energy efficiency standards. What if those energy efficiency standards, green building standards included, they kind of include it now, but they actually required information about material specification so that these, what is actually put into these buildings um, is meet certain requirements um, or does not include certain chemicals. Um, I think that's an indirect way to kind of have a, it's it's not a policy lever necessarily, but it is a it is a way to kind of use that system to um, affect millions of homes, particularly homes that might be for low income residents. Um, and I think we need to kind of be creative um, in that space. Joe, you did you want to? 
So uh, what I want to say is uh, EPA, we don't have, uh, we all know we don't have uh, uh, regulations for the authority to regulate any indoor chemicals and the concentrations. Uh, but uh, as um, Robert mentioned, we have TASCA. We also have Indoor Air Act. Um, uh, those will help to uh, <clears throat> measure, uh, I mean, um, regulate or in the other way, not direct way, uh, regulate some of the uh, chemicals. For example, under TASCA, we have the formaldehyde emission standards for con con composite wood product that will directly impact the indoor air, uh, indoor formaldehyde uh, concentrations. I wondered if we wouldn't have some comments, some answers to that question from the audience as well, because I think we have folks from NIOSH in the back and Consumer Product Safety Commission here as well. And so it seems like you have some control over uh, indoor spaces. Yeah. No comments? Uh, I, no comments? I see. Oh, somebody's coming to the microphone. That's great. So um, all regulations are different. So different regulatory agencies will have kind of different uh, statutory language and requirements, but I think there are some similarities. So any regulation would be based on a combination of measurement and model data and any available data using the best available science. Um, we would be looking for transparency. So, you know, when we do math and show exposure equals X, hazard equals Y, risk equals Z, and can others reproduce that math? And, you know, I think for indoor chemistry and um, taking what you're learning from these really in-depth measurements and what I would like to see would be operationalizing that and generalizing that to be able to say, what well, what did we learn in these couple of homes with really in-depth measurements? Can we apply that more broadly to different kinds of buildings or different kinds of spaces? Um, there's an exposure factors handbook chapter, chapter 19 called building characteristics. And what's in there right now is air exchange and uh, room volume and house volume, but you know, other things could be added to that, like uh, surface to volume ratio or interzonal airflow or relative humidity. And you could see how you could get these different kinds of building spaces that represent different parts of the country. So if you put in one emission rate, you would get a range of you know potential concentrations across the country and increase your kind of uh, ability to generalize what you're learning between measurements and models. Any other uh, thoughts from the audience on that question? No, oh, okay. Oh, sure. Vita. One more thing here and. So first, as a federal employee, I'm not supposed to argue for particular uh, regulations or, or legislation, but I think we should, but not, it's not because of that that I want us to take a moment to perhaps appreciate the fact that it may or may not be um, the right tool at this point in time for our understanding of indoor chemistry to have uh, regulations on, on the table. There are uh, perhaps other um, avenues and uh, other ways of uh, um, that increase in the process also the public understanding. I Just because I, I said before, the indoor chemistry doesn't get as much attention as perhaps outdoor air, but uh, the additional uh, legislation and regulation may uh, not all solve as many problems as as we think, and some of our colleagues that have operate with uh, um, in spaces that are more highly regulated can testify to that. So there are some advantages we want to move carefully, but particularly we want this these tools to follow the science rather than precede it. That that to me seems the most important thing. Trey. It's easier to ask questions than to answer them. <laughs> uh, and, and again, these these are my uh, 
thoughts and not those of the commission. I, I do want to follow up my colleague Charles's uh, answers that we do, the, the, and as EPA said, you know, there's no direct for understand regulation of the indoor air. We do have authority over products and, you know, oh, and I'm on a panel later, can talk a little bit more about that, but, I, but individual products, and we tend to look at emissions from that product and, you know, it, the potential risks. You know, there are other agencies like FDA that have jurisdiction over personal care products and so forth. So there, there are, you know, cross-jurisdictional issues. But I think to the earlier question, again, there are regulation for these products, regulations under the, for example, the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. But again, this is, has been on a primarily product by product basis. We are talking about ways to look at mixtures of chemicals. And I think later we'll talk about reactions. So I think that, you know, one of the questions, and I think as we're talking about research needs is better understanding. And I think that's gonna be sort of a thought that I'll have throughout the day is, is that, you know, do we have the data to be able to understand what these mixtures are, what these, you know, reactions are, what, what are we seeing in the indoor environment and from our perspective, what's coming, how is that resulting from, you know, individual consumer products? I'm going to uh, move to a question from the um, chat. So there's a question about, um, uh, are, are there any DALIs known for PFAS? And by DALI, I think they're referring to the um, disability adjusted life year. I'm not sure that, this group knows about dollies for PFAS specifically, but there's a related, uh, the, the question goes on. If ventilation rates are reduced through use of an IAQ procedure, concentrations of PFAS and um, I guess organic acids, I'm not sure, I think so, uh, could increase indoors. Thoughts? So yes, if you reduce ventilation, then probably the concentrations will increase. That's true. Um, and I guess I would say that um, much more is known. Most of the tox, uh, toxicological information about PFAS is for ingestion. And there's not very much at all for inhalation. So we just don't know. Okay. So I'm going to ask that question. I've, I want. I always like to ask, um, what are you passionate about right now? And I. Oh, by the way, speak to the microphone. From what I understand, they can't hear it when I turn away. So, so yeah. What are you passionate about right now? I'll. I'll go down the line. Um, well, I guess a lot of it, but I guess something that kind of rises to the top is actually providing. And I talked about this at the beginning. Is evidence based recommendations for mitigating exposures. Um, and that can be as simple as, you know, it, we did a study very recently that we're putting the Corsi Rosenthal boxes in, in classrooms. Um, that's great for COVID. That's why they were there. But we found actually they significantly reduced airborne concentrations of phthalates and PFAS. Um, and that is something that I think we need to keep testing those. Like that was kind of the hypothesis. It worked. And when we find these findings, we need to share that. Um, and we need to get that out there. So developing these kind of mitigation strategies um, and testing them I, is kind of where I'm, a lot of my research is focused right now. Well, uh, personally, I, I find the modeling aspect of uh, indoor chemistry um, the most exciting at this point. Um, and it, for, for a number of reasons, um, first, because it's, it's certainly uh, a, an interesting tool and uh, and we can do um, a lot of uh, what if analysis that um, would be difficult to do otherwise. That's true of every modeling, but I think in particular um, for indoor environments, modeling is indispensable because of the one, one of the greatest challenges really of uh, operating in, in, with indoor air is the variety of indoor spaces. The air that we have in this room right now is different from that in, in the next building or for that matter, even in, uh, in another room of the same building. And uh, some of these differences matter, some don't, but the, the way to understand them is really um, 
yes, you have to measure, but uh, you can't possibly measure everything everywhere. And so certainly this is one of the tools that, that help. It also helps in trying to understand what are the most impactful changes that you can make because of the freedom essentially that you have to uh, that, that you can play with the different parameters and the different solutions so um these are there, there would be more but I, I just want to say that despite the passion we always have to uh, modelers have to remind themselves all the time that what they're looking at is an abstraction of the real world in the same way that a map of a building is not the building. And uh, so uh, experimental measures and uh, verification of uh, everything that we do is, uh, is necessary. So uh, I'm um, currently interested in developing methods and uh, test protocols for studying the indoor uh, chemicals source and feed and transport and their mechanisms. Uh, also the exposure uh, test protocols, especially for uh, chemicals from consumer product and building materials. Uh, I would like to see like a very uh, a standardized, uh, a generalized uh, test method instead of just focusing on one chemicals at a time. Thank you. Oh, well, my first thought is that I should say I'm passionate about being outdoors, <laughs> which is true. But um, you know what I think it would be really helpful is if we designed a field campaign, and I think that the design somewhat to, to some degree was led by modelers, but we don't do it now, right? We do it maybe in four years, okay? And by designing that field campaign led by modelers, we will figure out what are the, really the key things that we need to measure before we go to the field, before before we do a, you know, and and then the purpose of that big field campaign would really be to test our understanding, right? And I would I think that would be really helpful in um, directing the measurements people to the most effective uh, and important um, things to do in the meantime. You're very uh, succinct in your passions. I like that. You're right to the point. We have a few minutes. Um, I, I'll uh, take one more from the... Um... So here's an interesting question. Have any studies been done in schools versus housing? When children come home from school, they reek of chemicals. Any thoughts there? Or, or anybody in the audience has done any schools related work that could speak to that uh, question. Um, we have tried to get into schools. It is really, really hard to do measurement studies in schools. Um, there are some good studies out there that look like um, use some kind of low cost sensors in schools and things like that, but a kind of a quantitative assessment in schools is pretty difficult to do. Um, so it's, yes, I mean, that would be a great thing to look at. Um, it's just practically very difficult to do, yeah. I see a lot of nodding heads out there in the audience, folks that have uh, tried to do this or are participating in that and they find it very difficult. Any comments on that? On that? Yep. Could you go to the microphone? I would say also it is hard to get into schools and each school is different. So you find a lot of schools with varying HVAC systems and age of buildings and how they're operated and level of support within the school itself. So I think that makes it even harder to grapple with doing those types of comparisons. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we have a couple of minutes. I had one more uh, question that's sort of getting into some details, but so what we see and what we've seen in some of the talks here and what we'll see in later presentations is that we have these sources that we think of as primary sources. And then we also have secondary, we have these transformations that take place. And um, uh, both of our speakers alluded to some of those transformations. Um, how do we, from a you know recommendation perspective, uh, regulatory perspective or otherwise, um, 
value the primary versus the secondary um, if we have enough information to just say what's going on. Can we can you regulate something that isn't originally put into that environment because it was changed in that environment? Let me let me try it first. Um, so this is an interesting question because it really goes to the root of why we're doing indoor chemistry in the first place, and uh, and we must recognize that we have had some uh, successes if we just focus on primary pollutants and uh, and taking a look at at those and uh, what can we do to reduce those uh, first. And secondary pollutants are a second order effect. So in, in a sense, you have to uh, understand first how important it is compared to the primary ones and then decide if it's at what level of uh, attention it needs to rise. Um, we know fairly well what is the list of uh, pollutants that bear the burden or the, that inflicts the greatest burden of disease, disease on, on, on people. And as it was even just a very recent paper that did that analysis, I think Morantes and, and others, that, that really looked at that. And so we know it's PM. It's NO2 and other nitrogen species, it's aldehydes and so on. Um, so a first approach would be to say, well, let's take them uh, individually at isolation. You get the biggest bang for the buck by doing this uh, in, in this in this particular order. But, but then you have to really look at a, a second look is to really say, well, OK, some of these pollutants like you were saying, are not uh, released by anything that we have in there. Particles is a classic example and, uh, and, one, and the one that has been studied the longest. So how much of the indoor particles are coming from secondary reactions indoors as opposed to uh, particles emitted by the activities or coming from, uh, from outdoor air? It depends, of course, that's not the kind of answer that we want, but uh, but that's where our understanding of the uh, indoor air chemistry as a system is is helpful. And the same we could do of, uh, of the other species that I listed as well. And let me stop and see if others want. You want us to talk more? Yeah, just, just so, one. Yeah, we're, we're basically done, but you can if, say a few. I would guess that, you know, it's complicated too because of the, um, the there are often two actors. So let me just take the case of if you, um, if one places an indoor air cleaner in their house that generates OH radicals, is it the VOCs that go into the indoor air? cleaner that are the problem because they then make oxidants, uh, you know, um, aldehydes, for example? Um, or is it the indoor air cleaner produced OH that makes the problem? So, um, you know, there you go. Let, let, go, go ahead. Let go. me pick it, back, pick, pick it up again on that because it's an important point. I think that this uh, this aspect is really uh, critical and and it's why we want this understanding. In some ways, we are seeing happening indoors what uh, has happened with outdoor air in the past, where uh, people, for example, trying to regulate uh, ozone, to regulate to reduce ozone. Uh, the dilemma was: Do we reduce the which precursors? Do we reduce the nitrogen oxides? Do we reduce the VOCs? That's to the point that. Um, Barbara was was talking about, and I think that in it's been raised more recently to our attention, really. That yes, we have been looking at all the oxidants indoors; they are certainly important. But we also probably want to start thinking about levels of bringing the volatile organics down, because that is really one of the 
a fundamental ingredients here, one in which we can have some control at least, and we have talked definitely about the, the stuff that we bring into our homes. Yeah, we have a question here. Just, I'm going to offer a very succinct answer to the question you asked a few minutes ago, which you asked about regulating the secondary pollutants. And I think that this shows us the value of studying indoor chemistry because the only way to regulate or control those secondary pollutants is to understand the most important primary factors that we can control. So that would be certain types of chemical air cleaners, regulating ozone or trying to re reduce the amount of ozone that comes indoors because we know that that's going to produce secondary pollutants. So the, I, again, the, the succinct answer is you can't regulate the secondary, but being aware of the secondary helps you identify what you can control. Thank you, Brett. Um, so we do need to take a short break. Um, I want to thank our panelists um, uh, for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, we'll try to get back in about five to seven minutes. Does that sound good? Quick break.